Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And as always, on behalf of Alice, Mark, and myself, and everybody that's part of Bible Talk, we want to greet you in the wonderful, precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're glad you can be with us as we get into God's Word, because that's a place of life, instruction, and life, and instruction, instruction. training in righteousness, correction, reproof. It's all kinds of good stuff in God's Word. It's all there. It's all, all there. Me. So that's why that's why we do it. That's why we need to spend time in His Word. Because these are days, you know, you hear on the news about false news. Uh, fake news. Fake news. Mm. Jesus said that in the last days, had the time not been cut short, even the elect could be deceived. Yeah, the only protection you have against being deceived, deceived is the truth. Mm -hmm. And Jesus had said in John chapter 8 that if you abide in his word, you dwell in his word, then you're truly his disciples. You will know the truth and the truth will make you free. Hallelujah. So that's the importance of us spending time in God's word. All right. We're continuing on in our study of Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus, the Ephesians. Uh, this is our third chapter, the third part of that we're not in the third chapter of the letter no, by any means. Uh, and, and again, the reason we're going through this in some detail, because this is a Bible study. Our purpose is to study the Bible, not to memorize a verse or two. It's to come to know the Word of God, because Jesus Christ is the Word of God who was made flesh and dwelt among us. So I'll just pray. Father, mm -hmm. we just ask that you bless our time together today. Mm -hmm. Lord, that you would open the eyes of our hearts to have great understanding of your word, that we would have new and new wisdom and understanding of what you've said. And Lord, that by the power of your spirit working within us, that we would live the word that we're studying. We just ask this, Father, in Jesus' precious name, amen and amen. Amen. Stop in. You ready? Stop in. Okay. Let the games begin. We had left off last week. Uh, in, in verses 7 and 8. We hadn't completed that, right? So I'm going to pick up there again. So I'm, I'm going to read uh, Ephesians 1, 7 and 8. And we're going to pick up in the middle of that verse, by the way. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight, so what we left off and I want to talk about now is the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. We have to understand what, well, I'll tell you, let's understand what David wrote in the Psalm, Psalm 49, verses 7 and 8. Because he said, no man can by any means redeem his brother or give to God a ransom for him. For the redemption of his soul is costly and he should cease trying forever. Costly. Possible. You can't go to church enough. You can't tithe enough. You can't fast enough or feed the hungry enough. You can't clothe the naked enough. You can't by any means, is what it says, redeem your brother or yourself. For the redemption of any soul is costly. How costly? Well, you all know this verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. John 3, 16. The cost was, was Jesus Christ Amen. on the cross. That's the only acceptable sacrifice. That's the only sacrifice that can make you right with God, an unblemished lamb, the unblemished lamb. So Paul wrote to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 5, 5 521 and said, he made him, talking of Jesus, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And then Paul writes in this letter, later in this letter in Ephesians, and he says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. It is indeed about the blood of the Lamb and the Father's amazing grace. You know, I, I'm trying to make a... As a matter of fact, we, we talked uh, this Sunday, I talked about 
getting back to basics and, and creating habits, getting to a place where you make certain things. It's like muscle memory, where you say things, you do things so repetitively that it just becomes the habit of your life. Right. And uh, one of the habits that I am trying faithfully to develop is because people say to me all the time, I'm sure you hear this, somebody will say to you, God bless you. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of a trite statement. To, I mean, they may mean it, but to many people it's just like, okay, God bless you. And when people say it to me, I say, he does far, far more than I deserve. Because I don't deserve any of it. You don't either, by the way. <laughs> None of us do. None of us do. So Jesus Christ took the punishment that we deserved, that we might have the eternal life that only he deserved. Mm. Right? But we've got to come to that place where we understand it. Otherwise, it's easy that you would start to boast in what you've done, because you think what you have done has brought you to that righteousness in Christ. It's not. It's all about the Father's amazing grace and the blood of the Lamb. All right, I'm going to move on to verse 9, right? I'm going to go down to verse 9. He made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him. The mystery of his will. Now, you see, we've been, we've been misled. Because you think a mystery is like on a half-hour television show mm -hmm. where you're watching, you know, they start and they put all the clues together and they work it all out and figure it all out. A mystery in the biblical sense is not about like Sherlock Holmes following clues. It's about you and I following Jesus mm -hmm. and having truth revealed to us. That's one of the dictionary definitions of mystery. Any truth that is unknowable except by divine revelation. It's got to come to you from revelation from God. It's not about figuring out the clues, right? It's not a detective story. Now, there's a really good example of that, which I'm you're probably familiar with, and it's recorded in Matthew 16. Jesus had said to his disciples, he's talking to them, and he says, who do the people say I am? Right? You know, you know that? Right. Yes. But then he turns to them, and he says, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. That's divine revelation. That's what Jesus said. Now, I talked last week about Christianity being a family affair, right? Yes. By the way, if you missed last week, it's always up there on Bible Talk, www.bibletalk.com, so you can go watch all of the Bible studies. But last week I was talking about Christianity, and Christianity is not church roles. It's, a, it's about a family. It's a family affair. And Paul, writing in this letter about us being adopted by our Heavenly Father. So Jesus clearly defined what that means when he was told he was teaching in a house, and somebody came up to him and said, your mother and brothers are outside. They want to speak to you. Mm -hmm. And it says in Matthew 19, 49 and, Matthew 12, 19, 49 and 50, it says, stretching out his hand towards his disciples, he said, behold, my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of my father who is in heaven, he is my brother and sister and mother. You're part of the family because you do the will of God. And, of course, the corollary to that is if you don't do the will of God, you're not part of the family. So, but we talked about this a lot, you know, the Pharaoh of Egypt calling the people uh, to do things and then not equipping them. Mm -hmm. God will never call you to do something without equipping you. Right. So he's not going to tell you to do his will without telling you what his will is. Right. It's not hiding that from us. So the mystery is revealed, mm -hmm. Right. In Isaiah 55, I'm going to read verses 8 and 9. God spoke through the prophet and said, from, this is God speaking, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Over and over, Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, You have heard it said, but I say to you. What they had heard was the tradition of the elders and the religious ways, and now they were being trained in righteousness. 
No, we've got to be transformed by the renewing of our mind, right? So I'm going to say this, and you need to contemplate, think about this, cogitate upon it. Mm -hmm. Organized religion, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, and even beyond into the present day, with all of the rules and regulations and the many laws that they have, they might lead a person to a healthier and nicer life here in this planet, but it can never bring anyone to eternal life. Okay, that's what we're talking about. The only way is the shed blood of Jesus. Mm -hmm. I mean, listen, in the book of Levit Leviticus, as they're going through the wilderness, a desert wilderness, they were commanded not to eat pork. Right. Well, there may have been some religious significance to that, mm -hmm. but I'll tell you what, you don't want to eat pork when you can't refrigerate it and you're out in the hot climate of the desert, right? You get trigonometry or something. <laughs> Trigonosis. <laughs> that too. Yeah. So don't eat pork in a desert climate with no refrigeration. That's what Leviticus 11.7 means. But I want to start this by telling you what is not God's will, mm -hmm. because he makes that clear. Samuel said, I'm reading from 1 Samuel 15.22, Samuel said, has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. That's what God's looking for. He's looking for us to obey his voice. David, a man after God's own heart, said, sacrifice and meal offering you have not desired. My ears you have opened. Burnt offering and sin offering you've not required. Then I said, Behold, I come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me. I delight to do your will, O oh my God. Your law is within my heart. Psalms 40, verses 6 and 8, 6 through 8. That should be our delight, is to do God's will. Amen. Because then David, a little further on in Psalm 51, verses 16 to 17, he said, you do not delight in sacrifice, otherwise I'd give it. You're not pleased with burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. Animal sacrifices were never the heart and the mind of God. But that said, his will was made clear as he spoke through the prophet Isaiah about his son, Jesus Christ. In Isaiah 53, I'm going to read verses 7 to 11, and it's worth listening to the whole thing. He, this is talking about the Messiah, right? The one coming. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before its shearers, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due. You see? He was cut off. He was killed. Yes. Because it was due us. The wages of sin is death. And then it says in verse 9, he says, His grave was assigned with wicked men. Yet he was with rich, a rich man in his death because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. He will prolong his days and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many and he will bear their iniquities. What do you think John the Baptist meant when he said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world? It was the will of God to set us free from the stain, the corruption, the consequence of sin by the sacrifice of Jesus who gave up his life that we might live. He said, nobody takes my life. He gave it up. And it is clearly his will that we follow the example of, his, of Jesus and offer ourselves. Paul again, blessed Paul here in, in Romans, his letter to the Romans, chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. You always have to remember 
But Paul wrote a little further on here in Ephesians, right? which we'll get to one day. But I'm going to read now from Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. Because he said, and you can't make it much more clear than this, by, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Because I'm going to tell you something. The minute you start to think, that you're right with God because of what you've done, you're going to boast. And before you do that, this is a homework assignment. Go read the end of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7, where people are coming to him. And he says, many will come to him on that day Mm -hmm. saying, Lord, Lord, look what I did in your name. We prophesied, we cast out demons, we did this, we did that. Can you imagine coming into the presence of the Lord God Almighty with nail-scarred hands who died in your place And saying, look what I did. And he says, depart from me, you evil ones. I never knew you. All right. I'm going to go on to verse 10 now. Ephesians 1, verse 10. And I'm going to read from three different translations. I normally use the New American Standard. I've used the King James and the English Standard Version. And I'm going to read from all three of those. With a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times, That is the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heaven and things on earth in him. And then in the King James, it says that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things to Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. And lastly, I'm going to read from the English Standard Version. As a plan for the fullness of times to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Do you get the picture that what Paul is writing about is the end of time? All right? Summing up. The summing up. To the fullness of times, to the summing up of all things. Mm -hmm. He's talking about the last days. Remember that this starts in the end of the previous verse, stating which, which he, the Father, purposed in him, Jesus, with a view to the end. I want to tell you that the Apostle Paul had a fixation on the goal, mm. on the end. You know, it says that the, the, the end of a matter is better than its beginning. Mm-hmm. Wherever you are right now, you're listening to this. You're not in the end of the matter. You're, you're in the middle somewhere. Mm-hmm. And God has nothing good. To, I mean, the, the, the middle is on its own. You know, uh, many of the tribulations are the afflictions of the righteous. That's, that's the middle. This is about... And the scriptures are pointing us, always pointing us to the goal. Yes. And that goal is to be yes. with him. Right? Mm-hmm. Because, you know, the life and death of Jesus Christ truly only had one purpose or had one true purpose. Right? In Revelation 22, I'm going to read verses 1 to 4. That's the last chapter in the Bible. That's got to be about the end, eh? Mm-hmm. Then he showed me a river of water of the water of life clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street, on either side of the river, was a tree of life, bearing twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There will no longer be any curse, and the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it, and his bond servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. That's the fullness, that's the goal, that's the end. And everything in Scripture is leading us to there. It is it is about the great by and by. Mm-hmm. It's not about the here and now. I mean, that's something that really grabbed hold, I think, during the uh, charismatic renewal and everything. Mm-hmm. You know, it's all about getting it now, getting it now. You're not going to get it all now. No. You know, our goal, God can, that's, I'm not saying God can't bless you now. God's desire is to bless you. He can bless you in the middle of afflictions. He can bless you in the middle of trials. He can bless you in the middle of trials and tribulations and uh, persecution. But the goal is the end. That's right. Right? That's the prize. I did a study, and you can go look this up on our website, about the whole history of mankind. And it goes from the fact when Adam was formed, Mm -hmm. God took clay and he formed. So man went from being formed then he sinned, he went to being deformed. And all after that, when he's out, out of the garden, not in the world, and he's being misinformed, mm-hmm. all the false prophets and false religions, 
And then Christ showed up and he was reformed. He was reformed, right? Mm -hmm. But then we're commanded to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And finally, the great promise of Scripture is that we would be conformed into the image of his son, Christ Jesus. But the goal is back to the tree of life in the fullness of his presence. Mm -hmm. And that's what the promise is in Revelation 22, right? That's the end. So Paul in this verse takes us right to the fullness of time, the end of the matter. It's hardly surprising considering that he obviously had his eye set on the goal as he wrote to the Philippians, Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Philippians 3, 13 and 14. And, you know, Paul is consistent in his teaching. So he wrote to the Colossians and he said, set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. Colossians 3, 2. How much time do you spend setting your mind on the things above compared to what you're thinking about what's going on in your life right now, right here and now? It was that attitude and the knowledge of God's love that gave Paul the power to endure all things and would be the foundation of this statement that he made to the church in Corinth. This is from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 17 and 18. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. His eye, his mind, and his heart were focused on the fullness of time. And if you're walking in faith, remember, faith is the assurance of things hoped for not seen. The evidence, right? It's what awaits us. Don't be distracted. That's one of the schemes of the devil to get you off the path of righteousness is to distract you with the things of here and now and the, the, keep your eyes fixed on Jesus Christ. All right, moving right along to Ephesians 1.11. Talking about in him, we have also obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will. We have obtained an inheritance. Ta -da. It says heirs, the promise. We're joint heirs. I was just going to read that. Romans 8, 16 and 17. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. We are joint heirs with Christ. Now, as, as much as I have heard that beautiful truth about our inheritance taught and preached, I very rarely hear messages talking about the other side of that coin. Okay? We're joint heirs with Jesus. Mm -hmm. But also in Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians 6, I'm going to read 9 and 10. And listen to this. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Pretty clear. That's pretty clear, but I'll tell you what. In most of the world and in many too many churches, that's considered hate speech. Yes. Many churches today seem to be boasting in the fact that they're considering themselves to be non-judgmental. I was just going to say, because they yeah. consider you being judgmental. Yeah, but the, so the churches are boasting that they're non-judgmental in that they will not talk about sin. They have effectively taken those verses, like I just read from 1 Corinthians 6, along with so many others, and removed them from God's Word in practical terms. And by not proclaiming this... They're sending these people right to hell. Because they're more concerned with the here and now and their interests yes. than they are with the eternal interests of God. Right? Mm -hmm. God sends prophets to guide his people, to warn his people, 
and to always point to Jesus. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, it says in Revelation 19.10. Okay. If you're a di disciple, that's what we're called all through the New Testament, right? Being disciples? Yes. That requires discipline. That's the same root word, by the way. Disciple, discipline, right? Mm -hmm. Your prophets have seen for you false and foolish visions, and they have not exposed your iniquity so as to restore you from captivity, but they have seen for you false and misleading oracles. That's Lamentations 2.14. Which leads me to repeat what John wrote in his first letter. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. 1 John 4, 1. I'm telling you that there are so many churches that boast in the fact that they, they won't talk about sin because it turns people off and turns people away. Well, it's turning them from the way is what it's turning them, from the way of life. Because we're talking about God's purpose, his purpose, and the counsel of his will. That's what this verse said we're looking at, right? To bring us back into the fullness of his presence, like in the garden, to the tree of life and before the throne of God and of the Lamb, to accomplish his desire that we would walk humbly with God. That's what it says in Micah 6.6. 6. To be with him and to be like him. That's the goal. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed into the image of his son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. Romans 8, 29. That's the great promise in the word to every believer, that God is at work. We're the, he's the potter, we're the clay. He is molding us and shaping us, forming us into the image of his son, Christ Jesus. And as I, I never think I get this right, mm -hmm. I don't remember whether it was Michelangelo or Da Vinci that did the David, oh, right. the statue, statue of David. Of David yeah. But he was asked one time, like, how can you, is this, is this not amazing that you can take this block of stone or a block of granite or a block of marble and turn it into this incredible work of this statue? How do you do that? And he said, I cut away everything that's not David. The way that God is going to conform you and I into the image of his son, Christ Jesus, is by cutting away everything in our lives that is not Jesus. To which we should be saying, thank you, Father, and hallelujah, and glory be. All right? Well, we didn't get as far. Are we as, done again? Are we done again? <laughs> How does that happen? Because what's happening is the earth is spinning <laughs> and, yeah, and time, it's amazing. Time so goes fast. fast. And as the old saying goes, time flies when you're having fun. And I pray that you're having fun may not sound like the right word. But getting closer to the Lord, getting more and more knowledge of the word, getting more into the word, getting more of the word into you and me should be fun. Amen. I don't know what the world has to offer to compete. So, Father, we just thank you, Lord God. We thank you for your word, which blesses us, changes us, conforms us into the image of your son. But above all, we thank you for the word who was made flesh and dwelt among us. We thank you for the gift of your son, Christ Jesus. And I pray, Lord, by the work of your Holy Spirit in our lives, that we would go into the world and people would see Christ in us by the lives that we now live in Jesus' name. Well, hallelujah. God bless you. And until next week, when we'll be back, and I pray that you will, may God bless you and use you for the glory of his name. Bye-bye. Thank you. Mighty love